Good morning. You know, last night, until last night actually, being from Andrews, I used to, I, used, I was thinking moving to Massachusetts. Oh, they don't have any kind of lightning storms here. I was convinced last night. What a light show. It was beautiful. Thank God for the beautiful, um, the rain that we've had, for we really need it. And it's good to be here in fellowship this morning. Welcome. A few announcements before we begin. This is a reminder about small groups. Sign up sheet in the lobby. We'd like to encourage each one of you to think about and joining one of these small groups. And if the group, if the uh, sign up becomes full, we will add more groups to these uh, small groups that we have. As always, we encourage you to read the Church of Life section of your bulletin to keep you informed on the meetings and events coming up with our church family here. Some of us become so involved with church uh, worship that we sometimes forget to read the bulletins. This is to remind you to try to take just a few moments and go through those announcements. AUC SA Mixer at the Field House tonight following the six o'clock Vespers. Those of you uh, who would like to be involved with that, just take note of that, please. Next Sabbath is African Day in Worship of the Girls Dormitory at Preston Hall, Kilgore Chapel. Sabbath schools at 9.30, 11 o'clock worship, and a potluck falling afterwards. Bring your own lunch. And at 3 p.m. next Sabbath, African culture versus the gospel. So I would like to uh, encourage each one of you to go to that. Before we begin, I'd like to invite each one of you to specifically select someone who you do not know and shake their hand. Let's, let's have a right hand of fellowship right now. The call to worship on this Labor Day Sabbath comes from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light.
Let us bow in prayer. O God above, O God of love, look down on us today and bind with your golden bonds of love each one of us today. May our stony hearts be melted as we encounter you, O Lord, before the throne of grace today. May our stubborn wills be subdued as we contemplate anew the cross of Calvary on that lonely hill of old. And as a potter shapes the clay, may you shape us and mold us and make us into fit instruments of beauty and utility so that the kingdom of God may be enhanced in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our schools, and in the world. These things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, church. Well, I know that we are few, but I don't want that to be indicative of the offering I'm going to get. So good morning, church. Good morning. Great. Thank you. Corrie ten Boom once said, I hope that when we go to heaven and we look back at this time, we will not be ashamed that we have <coughs> so lived as beggars and we are king's children. Tremendous, rich, connected to God, we have all power, all his love, all his riches to influence the world for the sake of the gospel. I have a question for you. What would you do if a billionaire gave you a blank check and said, make it out for the amount you want. You'd probably think you were dreaming, would you not? Well, you're not dreaming. God has given each believer a blank check written against the treasury of heaven. The whole treasury of heaven is open to those he seeks to save. Having collected the riches of the universe and laid open the resources of infinite power, he gives them all into the hands of Christ and says, all these are for man. That includes women too. Use these gifts to convince them that there is no love greater than mine in earth or heaven. His greatest happiness will be found in loving me. Now today, let's not be stingy with these precious gifts, doling them out as if they were a limited quantity there is no end to the blessings and power that God will supply us if we will only connect ourselves to him. There are only a few of us here today. And today is warm. But let us think of January and February and March and let us remember that we need to fill those tanks with oil now. So I look forward to your really giving a good offering today. Remember the tithes is not yours, 
it's God's. So if you have even put the tithe envelope in the plate, that does not say that you are giving anything. Remember that check that is open. Give some of it today. Will the deacons come forward? Wait on the tides and offering, please.
this. Lord, enable us to give from our abundance, the abundance that you bless us with daily, flowing from your own love and unending resources. Amen. Please turn to the responsive reading section of your hymnal, and we will read together responsively number 772, Memorial of Humility. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped the towel around his face. After that, he poured water into the basin, and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them in the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you never will part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, The person who has had is only to wash his feet. His whole body is when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Oh, 
thy glory and thy grace. As we now separate for the service of humility, it is not a dismissal from worship, but a continuance. We are told that to those who have been baptized, this service serves as a rebaptism in miniature, cleansing us once again, and we all need that cleansing. We practice open communion in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You need not be a member of our particular church to join in with us. It is faith in Christ and his promises that gives efficacy to all that we do. So we invite everyone to join. Please be aware as we separate of the stranger or the newcomer who may not know quite where to go. Guide them along to the appointed rooms, one for ladies, one for couples, and one for men and then we return here for the Lord's Supper. May God be with us as we go on with our worship.
Let us pray. Spirit of God, speak to us now as we open your book, guide our thinking. And may our thinking lead us into action that is unto salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. From the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 18, our text comes this morning, reading verses 9 through 14 in a brief message entitled, Going Home Justified. <clears throat> and he also told this parable to certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. The scene is simple, but it is complex. Ordinary and yet profound. Two worshipers at prayer at the temple was no remarkable sight in Christ's day. Such a thing occurred every day in the week, several times during the day. But these two men, proposed by Jesus, stand out today by way of object lesson. Through his teaching, their simple acts take on universal meaning. There is a view of human life that is completely unique to God. The Lord does not see as we see though what he sees is what we seek to learn. His view of life and its meaning is our goal. And one thing this parable shows us is that he sees everything and everything has its meaning. The Bible speaks of this divine scrutiny in terms of grace when it says that the very hairs of our head are numbered with God, therefore we should not be afraid. I lost my wallet at the supermarket last week. You know how that feels. My license, credit card, bank card, library card, my ministerial credential. It was when I got to the counter to pay for my groceries that I realized it, and everything lost its importance. I left the groceries loaded there and began to go throughout that market looking for my wallet. I enlisted the help of a few of the workers, and aisle by aisle we combed every aisle, every row. I retraced my steps. I thought about the counters I had touched and could not find my wallet. Finally, I gave up with this prayer. Lord, you see it right now, wherever it is. Save it for me, if you so will. And with that, I went home. I left my phone number, but nobody called. But the next morning when I returned and checked at the service desk, they asked me to identify myself and brought it out to me intact. Every card, every precious item, and I knew that it was not just a matter of coincidence. I don't know who found it, but I know who led them to it. 
But we cannot believe that God is concerned, so concerned about us, that he takes note of lost wallets and lost keys, and yet believe that he is too busy to watch all our actions and read all our thoughts. So you see, the question of what Christ sees is always the crucial question for us. What is it he sees in these two men he proposes? Two ordinary worshipers at the altar who could not be more different from each other. And their prayers reveal their inner selves. They stand for two kinds of believers. One is commended by Christ and the other is not. The Pharisee is self-absorbed. He prays to himself about himself. We detest what he stands for and we fear it at the same time. For we recognize his attitude in something of our own. And it is not that he is more pronounced in his attitude than us. He is just more honest about it. He's completely stuck on himself and not ashamed to say it even before God. He is full of himself to the extent that he does not see it as a character flaw. His good works convince him of his worth. And there is no doubt he actually did perform all the good works he was bragging about. In modern psychology, the notion of self has replaced the concept of soul. Human dysfunction is traced to the conscious and unconscious contents of the mind, the tripartite division of id, ego, and superego. Wholeness of personality is equated with the coming to be of self in its fullness. Self-realization becomes the ultimate goal. Freud would have commended the Pharisee. He would have said that he was well evolved. But Jesus does not. In the Bible, all human need finds its explanation in the fall and its solution in the Savior. Dysfunction results from the assertion of self in separation from God. Wholeness of personality has its source in union with God's Son. In a living relationship, not of equals, but of Savior to saved, of Lord to servant. While the Pharisee compared himself with the tax collector, the tax collector was comparing himself with God. So, who was the most honest? And who was the most courageous? The tax collector in the story, he is the remarkable one. His words are strange and alien to us in all their glorious simplicity. In our heart of hearts, we long to be as he was. To feel genuinely that we are wrong is a truly rare experience. Very seldom do we actually feel, without making excuses, without inner justifications or compensatory reasons, that we are wrong, simply wrong. It is such an unpleasant thing to feel. It is so dark and so hopeless. We shudder and squirm. We move away from it like a hunted animal trying to avoid the pit. But the parable of Christ reveals that salvation is in this very pit. Within that self-obliterating admission of wrong, there is hope, there is healing, and there is blessing but only because Christ is who he is. How scarce and valuable a thing it is to sincerely repent. How sweet it is, how much to be desired. 
to expose oneself before God in sincere humility, hiding nothing, holding nothing back. It is the hardest and the greatest thing that any human can do to simply, sincerely repent. Jesus had a response to the tax collector's heartbroken, self-despising prayer. He said, this man, not the other, this man went home justified. It is this justification that we seek as we come to the Lord's table today. May he give each of our hearts true and sincere repentance. Reading from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and we, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. At this time, the elders and the deacons will kneel, and we invite the congregation to bow your heads for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, what a privilege and a joy it is to partake in this beautiful ceremony. And Father, as we partake of the emblems, let us not forget, let us each remember why. Why we are rededicating our lives to you. For you came down to this earth to die for each one of us. And as we contemplate about Calvary, let us re make a recommitment and a dedication right this very moment to you. And Father, we ask that you will claim the promise to create within each one of us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
now. Beginning with the bread, the emblem of our Lord's broken body, let us commune together. cup, a symbol of his blood. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us. Let us commune together. Amen. church say amen. amen this is the time of great joy among God's people when we come to the end of this service we know that we have been renewed in our relationship with Christ and with one another just before we dismiss let's take a moment to turn to each other and share in this renewal in a handshake and embrace of fellowship which is befitting the communion and the Lord's Supper service just somebody right nearby Sorry, I went a little soon, but I thought, well, I'm hot in the faces. I thought I saw, I thought I saw enough of the time one, but it was perfect. That's all right. We started late too. I thought, I'll just play. Can we finish at 12, 13? Is it fun? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Just one concluding reminder that is very important. This is your last chance today to sign up for our small group's prayer ministry, which begins next week. There are five or six of us who have gone through the training program and prepared ourselves to lead in small group ministries. You'll see the sign-up sheets in the lobby. No group is permitted to have more than 12 members. And in this small setting, 
we'll begin meeting together for midweek prayer and fellowship and sharing and study. One group meets here in the church, the others meet in various homes around town. Everyone is invited to join. If we run out of groups, we'll start more groups to accommodate you. We encourage every member of the church to become involved in a small group ministry. It will enhance your spiritual growth and your life. Now let's look to the Lord to be dismissed. And now may the very God of peace sanctify you through and through. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.